section of this unit, but also a very detailed section of this unit, is when we're going to talk about psychoactive drugs and how psychoactive drugs can play a role in our conscious reality. So what is a psychoactive drug? There's many different types of medications and substances out there. Is sugar a drug, for instance? Well, what we're defining as psychoactive drugs for this course is a drug that mimics a neurotransmitter in a way that would change our consciousness. So you might take lots of medication uh, for diabetes or for heart disease or what have you that may not actually change your consciousness. You may take some Advil or Tylenol that might uh, numb your pain receptors, but for the purpose of this lecture, we're not going to talk too much about those types of medications. Instead, we're going to focus on those that are considered exogenous chemicals to our endogenous neurotransmitters in a very heightened way. So an endogenous chemical, these are our naturally occurring neurotransmitters. These are the neurotransmitters that exist in our body that our body can manufacture, produce, release, and receive without ingesting anything. So these are much like the neurotransmitters we talked about in Unit 3, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, uh, etc. Versus an exogenous chemical is something that comes from outside the body, but it fits in the puzzle pieces and it will fit in the receptor sites and mimic our endogenous neurotransmitters. So think about endo as originating from within the brain or within the body and exo as originating from without the body. We're not saying here that exogenous chemicals are non-natural because many psychoactive drugs actually have a natural source or a plant source, uh, but it's important that they are originating from outside our body. And because of this, because they fit the puzzle pieces, many of them act as agonists for our endogenous neurotransmitters and they heighten our sense. They give us a sense that we have a heightened level of neurotransmitter. And that makes them psychoactive because it changes what neurotransmitters our brain is aware of and changes the activity of our brain. Now, before we go into details about examples of these psychoactive drugs, it's important to talk about how these endogenous and exo exogenous chemicals work and interact with one another. And it's important for us to talk about this in terms of tolerance. So if we think about uh, an exogenous chemical, for example, we're going to start off by thinking about heroin. It's a very potent exogenous chemical. And what often happens with it is it deactivates our sympathetic nervous system and activates our parasympathetic nervous system. It's very much considered a downer. So it slows down our heart rate, it slows down our breathing rate, it slows down our brain activity. So when we first take heroin, or if a person were to first take heroin, what happens is it activates the parasympathetic nerve system and calms them down and really slows down their system. Let's say they're going to take this for surgery or what have you. So that's what happens the first time you take it. If a person were to be on pills, let's say they're on Oxycontin or Dilaudid pills after a surgery and they had to take these pills at home, what might happen is every time they take these pills, it slows down their heart. So when they are about to take these pills, their heart might realize this, their brain might realize this, and instead of uh, slowing down their heart to the degree it was, their body might react in a way that would provide homeostasis. Homeostasis, if you recall, means same status. So homeostasis, our body likes being the same status. So rather than allowing this pill to slow us down that much, we might actually naturally produce endogamous chemicals that will speed up our heart and speed up our breathing and speed up our brain activity. Now what might happen is, let's say somebody had knee surgery and they had to take uh, a Dilaudid or Oxycontin pill every morning in, in the morning with their breakfast. What might actually happen is they start to become classically conditioned to this scenario. And as they walk into their breakfast table in the morning and they're going to take their painkiller, their heart rate might increase. Before they take the painkiller, their heart rate might increase just by the look of the refrigerator or the environmental cues in their kitchen. If you think about, about Pavlov's dog, it's the same thing going on here. Their heart rate will start to speed up. So I have these two arrows on the screen. And it's the idea that the chemical, the drug, the exogenous chemical will bring us down but right before that happens, we start to build up a tolerance where our body and our endogenous chemicals bring us back up. And after enough time has gone by, we might actually find that the drug is not having the effect on us. And that's because the endogenous up and the exogenous down, the arrows are the same size and they're canceling each other out. This is what happens when somebody builds up a tolerance to alcohol or when cigarettes don't seem to have an effect on them. And so they are building up a tolerance. This tolerance is what can lead to really intense addictions. You can have withdrawal without addiction as well. Really, really potent physiological addictions can be due to this tolerance building. And it's the idea now that their body is so used to going up and saying this endogenous chemical, they almost need the exogenous just to bring them down.
Let's imagine that person needs surgery, they've ran out of their Dilaudid pills, for example, and now they have to find another type of drug. So they're going to find a drug that works as an agonist and mimics Dilaudid or Oxycontin. So they're going to go for another narcotic. They might be going for heroin or fentanyl or something of that nature. And because the arrows are the same size, now they're going to strengthen their dose. They're going to take a bigger hit than what they did before. They want stronger stuff. And this is going to make the down arrow even stronger. So now let's say they shift from being someone who's medicinally taking Oxycontin for surgery and another habitual user who is using fentanyl or another type of opiate uh, via syringe, let's say. And so now what's happening is they are taking a very potent dose. It's, it's hitting their parasympathetic nervous system. It's calming them down and slowing their heart rate. And after they start to habitually take that, let's say now they're using it via syringe and they're using it in the bathroom while the tub is running so their family members can't hear them. So every morning they get up, they go to the bathroom and they're using fentanyl via syringe. Well, what might happen now is every time when they turn on the faucet in the bathroom, their heart starts pounding and they start breathing faster because that's their environmental cue and they're now classically conditioned and they're becoming much more wound up. And so now over time, they'll also build a tolerance to that stronger drug and the two arrows will balance themselves out again. This can keep going on and on and on. Another thing I want to point out while we're on this is how overdoses can happen. An overdose is something that can be very easy and very scary to happen if we change the environmental cues. Once somebody has built up a very significant tolerance to a very potent drug such as fentanyl or heroin, if we take away those environmental cues, let's say they can't get in the bathroom, let's say the bathroom is broken or there's a plumber there or a family member is in the bathroom and they're going to administer heroin to themselves via syringe but not in the same environmental cue. Well, what's going to happen then is if they just go back to their bedroom, they don't have that endogenous chemical release. They don't have that heart winding them up. And so they don't have that uh, complementary and compensatory arrow going up. And so when they inject themselves, uh, there's no up arrow, it's just a down arrow. And that down is gonna take them down lower than they've ever been before. And that is when they're at risk for overdose. And that's because now their parasympathetic nervous system is slowing down more than what they're experiencing. It's, it's making their heart stop, it's making their breathing fully stop, and they're at risk of death. So this is unfortunately the uh, biological mechanisms behind a lot of opiate overdoses, and it can be very distressing. But this can also happen with non-lethal uh, things too. If you're thinking about your cup of coffee and how that balances things out. And so it's important to understand, regardless of what type of exogenous chemical we're talking about, it can still have the same patterns with the endogenous chemicals in our brain. And so whenever you're administering repeated exogenous chemicals to you that are psycho psychoactive, it can deregulate. Now, although with cannabis, we don't tend to build up a huge physiological dependency on cannabis, we can get a psychological and environmental cue dependency to cannabis. But so although it doesn't have these huge arrows here, it can dysregulate things. We know that cannabis can act on our dopamine receptors and our serotonin receptors in our brain. And once, if a person starts to habitually take cannabis, for instance, our brain will stop producing endogenous serotonin and endogenous dopamine in the way that it used to. And for some members of the population, about 2% of the population who are at biological risk for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, using cannabis when they are a young adult can actually unlock and dysregulate those chemicals in the brain enough to cause a diagnosis for bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So something that's not considered highly addictive, because we don't tend to consider cannabis as a highly uh, physiologically addictive substance, can still dysregulate the endogenous chemicals in our brain.